Present Play is coming up in May. Ready to join a global village of like-minded parents and reclaim presence, peace and play for your family? We want to make Present Play available to everybody and so each year we offer scholarships to welcome on board Present Players who might not have otherwise joined us. We're accepting scholarship applications this week only, so check out the link below to apply now. Today I'm going to give you tips to teach your kids mindfulness. Are you ready to love parenting and parent from love? If so, slam on that subscribe button, hit the notification bell and meet me back here same time, same place every Monday. The Parenting Junkie Hi, I'm Avital. I'm the founder of The Parenting Junkie, where we empower parents, imperfect parents like you and me, who face chaos and clutter and conflict to reclaim presence, peace, and play in their lives. If you are ready to teach your kids a little bit more mindfulness, then slam on that like button so other people can discover this video too, and let's get started. Number one, be curious about their feelings. Mindfulness, in a sense, is about becoming aware of what we're thinking and feeling without judging it just noticing and being in touch with our inner worlds. In order to help our children to learn to do that, to provide the scaffolding for them to learn this skill, we can respond to their feelings as we would eventually want their inner voice to respond, their own selves to respond to themselves. When they're very little, we are a big co-creator of that inner voice. How we talk to them is often how they eventually talk to themselves. And that's why when I shame my child, when I call them names, when I blame them, when I yell at them, and I do, that's not ideal because I'm embedding within them that voice. Now, it's okay because there's always repair, none of us are perfect, and we need to strive to do this, you know, 60, 70, 80% of the time, okay? But there's going to be that 10 or 20% that's really not only imperfect, but even damaging. So just forgive yourself of that from the get-go. But how can we focus on the good stuff, on what we do want to do? Well, when they're feeling sad or even really enthusiastic or lots of anticipation or excitement or frustration or anger, any emotions, what we want to teach them to do is to notice those emotions and to notice them with curiosity. One of the best ways to do this is to compare emotions to the weather, right? We can ask our children, hey, how are you feeling inside? Is it sunshiny and bright skies? Is there a storm brewing? And we notice that whatever the weather is outside, it doesn't have an emotional charge. It's just the weather and it always passes and it just has its own flavor, but we give it meaning with our story. A big storm could mean something terrible if it's your wedding day and it's gonna ruin the whole day, or it could mean something wonderful if you're a farmer and you really need rain for your crops. It's all about the story we put on it. Emotions are the same. We can feel big emotions and they pass. They're just interesting. They're just an indicator. They're just something that we want to notice and be aware of. So when our kids are feeling very angry, very sad, very happy, etc., reflecting back to them, hmm, you're feeling really sad, I see. I see that sadness bubbling up inside you, is that correct? And just showing them that there's a word for this, there's a description for this, and it doesn't sway us. We don't get super agitated, oh, you mustn't be sad, don't be sad, stop crying. We're not rushing to fix it. We're just saying we can notice those feelings, and that's okay, we can put language to them, and we can be curious about them. Hmm, what does it feel like to be sad? Where do you feel it in your body? What does it make you think? Or what thoughts made you sad, etc. Just noticing, being aware, and being curious. Number two, also about awareness. First, we spoke about awareness and curiosity to our emotions. Another part of mindfulness is being aware of the present moment, being aware of where we are. So starting to notice with our children and take note, actually speak it, What's going on? Hey, we're in the bath now. We're splashing in the water. There are bubbles. I hear a bird outside, right? I see a tree. This is the weather. This is what I feel. This is what I'm tasting. Starting to be grounded in the present moment through our senses. What do I feel? In my body, what do I hear? What do I see? Starting to really take note of flavors as we eat, chewing our food more mindfully, being more mindful to tastes, to textures, to the present moment and to how it feels. So just bring that up with our kids, right? What are you noticing right now? Where is your body touching the ground? 
right? What sounds can you hear that are very far away? And what sounds can you hear that are really close by, such as even your breath? Perfect segue into number three, which is practicing breathing. Noticing breathing. Guys, I promise, I think I must have been at least 14 or 15 before I even noticed my breath. And that's when I started practicing yoga. Only there did I start to learn about holding your breath, different types of breath, connecting to your breath, being aware of your breath, and using your breath to calm you down. So we wanna to start to teach our children when they're getting bubbled up with emotions, when they're having trouble waiting, when they're having trouble sharing, when they're frustrated, anxious, scared, angry, we wanna to start to notice where is your breath at? Are you able to fill up your belly and expand your lungs? Can you make your chest really big? You can practice little breathing games with your kids. For example, you could put a cotton wool ball on the floor, one for you and one for your child, and see if you can blow it further, right? Or who can blow it further? Or if you don't wanna make it competitive, just how far you can each blow it. Just noticing that our breath has different qualities to it. When I'm blowing that cotton ball, I'm really kind of powerfully exhaling, right? Noticing the inhale and the exhale. One of the things I like to tell my kids to do when they're very upset and they want to calm down but can't is to pretend to blow out birthday candles. I hold up the birthday candles and I say, okay, blow it out. Just that action of blowing out and connecting to our exhale can be very soothing for some children. Another thing you could do is place an, a small light object on their belly and have them lie down and let them watch their belly rise and fall and notice this incredible rhythm that is with them at all times. Give me a love in the comments below if you love the idea of teaching your children to use breathing as a calming mindfulness tool and let me know if you have any ideas of how to do that as well. The next one is gratitude practice. I have a whole video about gratitude and how to introduce it in into your children's lives. I'll link to that below. But basically I wanna say gratitude is a mindfulness tool. It brings us back to be focusing our minds on the things that we want to perceive more of in our lives. It focuses us on calming down and being thankful for what we have rather than focusing on the things that are lacking and the things we're afraid of. When you're in a space of gratitude and love, you can't equally be in a space of fear and worry. And so having a gratitude practice established in all of the ways that I outline in that video is going to help your children be more mindful. It also just helps them be more mindful of their stuff, of what what they've got of what they've been blessed with in their lives. So you can do this in your dinner time, at bedtime, during bath time or first thing in the morning. It can be with a song, a prayer or just a little practice of noticing three things that you're grateful for that day. Most of all it's something that we have to model for our children, showing them that we are grateful and that we continuously point out the things that we're grateful for. The next one is forest bathing. It is absolutely proven without a doubt that spending time in nature, be it at the forest or at the beach or at the mountains, any type of nature that you can get to easily is going to be extremely beneficial on all levels, physical, emotional, and spiritual, and it helps you to practice more mindfulness. When you're in the forest, it's easier to disconnect from outside stimuli and be less distracted and really kind of bathe yourself in and your senses in a soothing but stimulating environment. The beautiful thing about nature is that it's balanced so that it's both challenging, right? It's hard to climb on those trees and those rocks and up the hill and up the tree. It challenges us, but it's also soothing. There's a very cohesive and harmonious palette. There are very soothing sounds. And generally, if you go in okay weather, then the outdoor air, the breeze, the wind is pleasant to the senses. So being in the forest allows us to connect to nature, to feel at one with nature. And it is also an excellent fertile ground for lots of mindfulness games. For example, pretending that we're different animals and noticing how those animals might walk feeling our feet touching the ground, noticing what sounds we hear, what we see, collecting some of the beautiful natural items like leaves or acorns and taking note of them. That brings us right down to this present moment and to gratitude. The next one is teaching our children to sit with their feelings. This is a hard one, I know. Most adults cannot do this. 
So you definitely have to have realistic expectations when it comes to all of the mindfulness practices. Never force it and never push it. But learning to sit with feelings is such an amazing skill that I wish we all learned in childhood. Dr. Lawrence Cohen, in his book, an incredible book by the way, The Opposite of Worry, teaches us how to be what he calls the second chicken. Okay, hold up, what does that mean? Basically, when a chicken sees another chicken freaking out and getting scared, it also freaks out and gets scared even if it doesn't see the source of the danger. So even if it doesn't see a fox coming to eat it, it will copy the first chicken. And humans are the same. If you see a whole bunch of people running down the street like crazy, scared for their lives, you'll probably start running in that direction too. Children look to us to indicate whether we feel safe or not, whether we're anxious or not, whether something is a big deal or not. And so if they have a big, strong reaction, we wanna teach them to sit with that emotion, then we need to indicate to them that it's okay. So if they're feeling very, very angry or very, very scared or very, very sad, our response is often to fix it, to stop it, to stop the feeling, right? Okay, okay, I'll get you the cookie. I'll, I'll tell them not to treat you that way. I'll get you back your ball, right? I'll fix the problem. Now, may or may not want to fix the problem. That's a separate issue. But your initial reaction should be that of the calm second chicken, the chicken that says, yes, those feelings have come up for you, but they do not need to overwhelm you. They do not need to flood you. They do not need to create this massive reaction in you. It's going to be okay. We will work with this. It's okay to feel sad. It's okay to feel angry. It's okay to feel frustrated. All of those things are okay. They don't get me riled up on your behalf. I can stay calm, see you in that situation, and then we can evaluate together. Now, that doesn't mean I don't empathize. I do, I empathize and I validate, but I don't take on the emotions and act them out myself. Like, yes, we need to be very stressed about this, or yes, it is, oh my poor baby, you're so scared, you're so scared, oh no, it is very scary. We don't wanna go that route. We wanna stay calm and teach them that their big feelings don't need to freak them out. Their big feelings pass. It's a wave. And that's what I mean in my peaceful tantrum webinar. You can go and watch it after this. I'll link to it below. That's what I mean when I say sitting with emotions. That's what I mean about being the calm second chicken. It means, yes, I see your big feelings. They're real. You experience them and they're valid. I'm not gonna just tell you you're okay, nothing happened. Something happened. But even when something happens and even when things are hard, we can still metabolize those feelings. We can let them Go, uh, go through their paces. We can let the wave ride and we'll ride that wave and let it calm down because what we're teaching them here is that all feelings pass. That's an incredibly important tool to learn. All feelings pass, so big feelings, notice them, accept them, validate them, empathize with them, do not rush to put a band-aid on or stop them. The next one is to model meditation and mindful practices. Listen. A lot of people ask me if I meditate in front of my children. And the truth is that it depends on the season and on my flow and how much help I have. And if I have an opportunity to meditate without my children, honestly, for myself, for selfish reasons, I prefer it because that's when I actually get to meditate. If I meditate in front of my children, they interrupt me. So if I have anyone else watching my kids and I have five minutes to spare, I prefer to do it alone, of course. But doing it in front of my kids, even if they do interrupt me, at least put those you know, ideas in their head that this is something that people do, that this is something that's available to them, that it's a good use of their time. And so if you can model that, even just for a few moments, I do my journaling, for example, typically in front of my children, and I'll sometimes do a five minute meditation and they'll get used to it. I'll kind of say to them, you know, unless there's a fire or someone's bleeding, I'm busy right now, I'm meditating, and that's a valid thing for me to be doing and you can't interrupt me. Can my babies not interrupt me during that time? No, of course not, it's not realistic. They do interrupt me and I often have to stop, but even a one minute meditation, 30 second meditation that they've witnessed is still good modeling. And when you are practicing mindfulness, as in noticing what's going on around you, being aware of your feelings and not judging yourself or your surroundings, you can voice that out loud. When you are in a long line at the supermarket or you're frustrated because of what your boss said, you can actually do deep modeling, which is when we show what's going on behind the scenes. Expose it to your child. You say, you know, initially I felt massive sense of frustration at that email that my boss just wrote me, but then I focused on my breath and I just watched those emotions and I noticed 
I witnessed myself and I didn't judge myself. I just noticed that frustration and I allowed it to pass. And now I'm feeling a lot calmer and now I have a clear head to decide how I wanna to respond to that email. Do you see? So if my child hears me say that, that sets them up for their success. It gives them that tool almost by proxy. It's like by osmosis. <laughs> they hear that enough times, it just becomes something that they know how to do for themselves as well. And my favorite point is this final one. Allow for discomfort. Allow for uncomfortable situations in your child's life. Do not rush to pacify, to solve problems, or to reduce their discomfort in any way, unless it's truly painful and frustrating. In yoga, it always goes like this. You push yourself to the edge of discomfort, you hold it there and breathe. But if it's painful, then of course you need to back off. We don't want our children to be in pain, but we do want them to experience a lot of uncomfortable situations. Let me give you some examples. Not getting the plate that you wanted, not getting the color pants that you wanted, having to wait your turn for something, having to wait in general, having to wait in the car for someone or wait for a gift that you wanted or wait in line at the bank, having to wait for a parent to be off the phone before you can speak to them. Being in discomfort in all of these kinds of ways, not getting exactly what you wanted, not getting exactly your preference, not getting it as quickly as you wanted. All of those things are excellent and important experiences. They're like vaccinations for mindfulness, right? You get a little dose of discomfort while you're a child, very low stakes. You learn to deal with that with mindfulness. You learn to work through those feelings. And then when that discomfort sometimes comes later on in life and it's a bit bigger, like losing your job, then you have that embedded in you of how you can handle that with equilibrium or relative equilibrium. So we want our children to experience many situations throughout the day, throughout the week, and you don't have to orchestrate this. You don't have to make them uncomfortable. Life has discomforts and dissatisfactions already embedded in it. It's preloaded with dissatisfaction. So every time your child says, it's not fair, or, I hate this, I don't like this, I, it's my turn, I should have got it, you can say, yes. I see. It's true. It's not fair. Life isn't fair. We have to deal with dissatisfactions all the time. I know it's not easy and I'm here to support you, but I'm not going to fix it. I'm not going to rush to pacify it. I'm not going to rush to change it. Try to smooth out all the bumps. We want them to feel each and every bump and learn to respond with mindfulness with our support. Now, I would love to hear from you. Which of these tips was your favorite? And what are your tips for teaching children about mindfulness and perhaps meditation? Have you ever meditated in front of your kids? How did that go? Give me all your tips. Lay it down on me in the comments below. I would love to hear. You are warmly invited to join my Facebook group, Love Parenting with Avital, where we talk about all things mindfulness, minimalist, and just peaceful parenting and play and peaceful partnering, all the fun stuff. Come on over there. It's lots of fun. And I would love to see you over on Instagram at Parenting Junkie, where I share a lot of the behind the scenes and a lot of my random spontaneous thoughts. Plus, I have a podcast now, The Parenting Junkie Show. You've been leaving me phenomenal reviews. I am so grateful. You can find it pretty much anywhere you listen to your podcast or just go to theparentingjunkie.com forward slash podcast to find the links.